Welcome to the Self Girl Nerds Podcast. I'm your host, Marie, a courage coach, creative soul, and adventure seeker. Since through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in 2019, I'm on a mission to help you embrace your most confident self so you can achieve your dreams too. If you're eager for deep conversations, big questions, and meaningful connections, join me on the quest to discovering how we can create a more magical and memorable life. Welcome to the Self Growth Nerds podcast, Laura. We're so happy to have you. Please say hello to the listeners and tell us about you, who you are, where you live, how old are you, what are you passionate about, all these kinds of things. Hi, Marie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on today. I feel very honored. My name is Laura, and I call myself a mindfulness meditation facilitator. And I've been doing this for a few years now. I live in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. And one of my biggest passions is nature. So that's kind of why we live out here. Um, I have a husband and a daughter, and uh, we just spend most of our time playing outside and I'm working, you know, with my mindfulness group and uh, yeah, that's about me. That's amazing. You're so lucky to be in the Pacific Northwest. These are the best forests. I love they, the, those big trees. They're insane. I mean, you go out and you like connect with a 400 year old tree and it's like, it's life changing. It really is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it makes me think of a silly story from when I was on the PCT. I was walking through a, a forest in the Pacific Northwest and thinking, wow, those forests, they smell like whiskey. So interesting. <laughs> and it turns out that it was my little bottle of Jim Bean that was upside down in my backpack getting emptied out slowly but surely. But I just <laughs> now associate that smell to that area of the yeah. world. I was trying to think, I'm like, does it smell like whiskey? Really? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Just me. <laughs> so, Laura, the, the, the goal in today's episode is to talk about self-compassion, which is mm. a topic that we've explored a lot through our sessions together. I want to first discuss when, when do, you, do you struggle to be compassionate towards yourself and why do you think that is? Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, parenting is when I have the hardest time being self-compassionate. I have a, she's a six-year-old, almost seven now. And the reason why I think that is, is because for me, I, I see kids and they're so vulnerable, right? They're like the most vulnerable population. They depend on us to meet all their needs. Their brains are still developing. They can't regulate their emotions. And they're looking to us to model what it means to like live life and to do this life. Like, how do I do this? Right. So there's a lot of pressure to not screw that up. And so when I do screw it up, when I fail, when I lose my temper or I get really annoyed, you know, my, my conditioned re reaction to myself is to just be really angry with myself and super guilty. And so in those moments, finding the will to then also be compassionate towards myself can be really, really hard. Mm, okay. And what does that look like? So what does the compassionate part look like? Like, how do I be compassionate to myself? No, actually, what does it look like when you struggle to be compassionate t towards yourself? Like, what's mm. the self-talk? Yeah. So there are all kinds of stories run through, right? Like, I should be doing better. I'm failing. I'm the worst mother to ever mother. You know, like, why do I keep screwing up? Why do I keep doing these things, the same things over and over? Like, it's just a bunch of self-critical, self-judgmental stories that play out over and over. And every mm. time it's kind of the same, you know, you, you, if you start to pay attention to this, you'll find it's like the same remarks are, sh are popping up over and over again. Because it's, mm. it's a habit. It's a conditioned response. So... Mm -hmm. Why do you think it might be helpful to to notice that the same remarks, the same kind of stories are always coming back? I think it just highlights the fact that so much of how we respond to life is uh, unconscious, right? We're not 
bringing a lot of awareness to the situation, to the stimulus, to the response, to what we're telling ourselves, because we learn a lot of these things when we're young. And so they just become habits, right? And so when we get older, the the habits that we've been doing for so long probably are not going to be serving us anymore. And so, um, yeah, so it's just important to notice uh, that the same stories are playing out over and over again, I think, because it helps us realize that oh, maybe there's not a lot of truth here. Maybe it's just a conditioned habit instead of being something that's actually helpful. Mm -hmm. For you, like the stories that come back uh, in in regards to parenting, where do you think they come from? Uh, I think that one of the ways that we learn to be self-critical is from watching our parents, right? So a lot of parents use criticism to try to control their kids, right? And it's not to put blame anywhere. It's just saying that's how a lot of us have grown up to learn how to be a parent. And so I think these stories come from me learning how I was criticized. And, you know, the the idea that if we criticize ourselves, like that's how we're going to change ourselves, right? Like that's how we're going to do better next time. I think there's this really deep belief that if I'm hard on myself, if I'm critical, then I'm not going to keep screwing up. And that is like one of the biggest fallacies about self-compassion and self-judgment is that, you know, we have to be hard on ourselves in order to change. And what really happens is that no change comes from that. I spent five years parenting this little person and being super judgmental of myself and not seeing hardly any growth come out of the, the stories that I was telling myself and the beating up of myself. Like there was no change. It wasn't until I started practicing awareness and kindness, self-kindness that I actually started to see some changes. So Okay. Now I'm thinking about all the people listening to us and I, I know for many of them, it is still the case. They still believe that. Like yes. you know, you've got to be hard on yourself in order to change. Like what you said, if we criticize, if I don't criticize myself, then I'm going to screw up. Oh, it just keeps screwing up. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. so how do you break that? So I like to use Dr. Kristen Neff's framework for understanding self-compassion. And she breaks it down to three main parts. And the first one we've kind of already talked about is mindfulness, right? Just bringing awareness to the fact that, oh, I'm being self-critical. Oh, what's happening? Oh, these stories are playing out in my mind. It's creating suffering, Right. Because ultimately what what compassion is, it's love meeting suffering. So the first step is just to be aware that the stories are playing out and that you're experiencing the suffering from those stories. Wait, what do you mean love meeting suffering? Tell me more about that. So ultimately self-compassion is just bringing kindness to our pain. Mm. That's what it is. So you can say love or care or kindness. These are kind of interchangeable. But just bringing some sort of tenderness or care to the pain we're experiencing. Okay. So that's step that, one. Yeah. The process, the step one of the whole process is just to even wake up to the fact that that's going on, right? So much of our time is spent being unaware and we can't make change or develop new practices if we're not aware. The second part is to, when you notice that happening is to put it in a bigger framework. She calls this common humanity. So taking a step back, saying, this isn't personal, right? I'm not the only parent who thinks that they've screwed up. I'm not the only one who thinks that they shouldn't even be a parent because they're so bad at it. I'm not the only one who's yelled at my kid, right? We're all in this together, this common humanity. We're all vulnerable and we're all imperfect and flawed. Just this, it really helps create some space where the kindness can enter. If we take a step back and say, I'm not alone in this. Mm-hmm. So that's the second step. Mm-hmm. It help, helps normalize. Normalize, exactly. Yep. Do you have a, uh, an example of like, uh, so, so you, for you, parenting is a big one. Do you have an example of how that would show up at work? Yeah, I think, you know, with work, I'll just speak to my experience, at least within my job. Um, there's a lot of like interpersonal drama that can arise, right? Like, I don't like the way this person is talking to me. I don't think this person should be telling me what to do. I think this person's idea is stupid. You know, there's like all this interpersonal drama. And 
it can create a lot of suffering because all day long, especially for me, and you know, I, I might be a little unique in this, but I work remotely. And so I'm not having a lot of the physical interactions, but when we don't speak our piece, it all lives in our head, right? And so there's all this mental drama going on. Same as with when you're a parent about like, oh, what's 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 really playing out here? Like, well, how is this dynamic with this person? And, and like, we don't really get to the truth. We just live in these mental stories and then it creates suffering. And then maybe we don't feel good about going to work um, and so on. And so again, same thing. First step, wake up. Like, Wake up to these thought processes, you know, wake up to these judgments and your self judgments and judgments of other people. And then understand that like everyone at work is doing this, right? We're all doing this. We're all having the same mental games play out. So it's like a very natural habit for me now to just be like, notice and normalize, right? Like that's kind of a way I like to do it. Notice and normalize. Oh, I'm not the only one doing this. Like a lot of these thoughts probably aren't true. And just take a step back from there. Notice and normalize. I love it. Two ends. Yeah. yeah. And what is step three? So step three is the part that a lot of people get hung up. A lot of people are like, oh, I can, I can become aware and I can normalize. That makes sense. The step three is where we then need to bring some level, some degree of kindness to ourselves, show ourselves some care in some way. And this is where a lot of people get stuck, right? So, and again, it's totally understandable totally normal. You know, I think most of us think like, why is it okay to be kind to myself? If I'm screwing up, why should I be kind to myself, right? That doesn't make sense. Being self-critical feels more natural. And again, you know, there's all these different forces that go into why we think this way. Like we talked about before our parents, right? The way we're raised, a lot of times that can play into it. Then there's an element of biology. Thinking self-critical thoughts helps us make sure that we conform enough to the group so that we don't get kicked out. So there's a survival instinct at play. There. Mm, that's super interesting. Okay, so it's yeah. wired into us. Yeah, to a degree, for sure. It's just easier to be mean to ourselves. Yeah, because we gotta we gotta stay in line, right? If we're if we're acting in a way that other people are not responding well to, we have to be critical so that we can get back in line and so that we're not left on our own to fend for ourselves. Because you know, and a lot of a lot of biological, it's evolutionary biology. It doesn't really apply to the way we live today. And so we're, we're seeing um, this crossroads of like, we have these parts of our brain that still work this way, but they're not helpful in the way that we live today. And so that's just one of them where we're like, got to conform so I don't, kick I don't get kicked out. So it's just helpful to be aware that that exists and that that's just another force driving you to think self-critical thoughts and that it's, it's totally normal. Mm-hmm. And then the last part I just wanted to say was our culture, right? Our culture does not value self-kindness. It's more of like a stoic uh, way of being. And when we're kind to ourselves, people can see that as being weak or indulgent or maybe even like some sort of narcissism. So there's all these forces driving us to think that we should be self-critical. So you're going against the current of how you've been brought up. You're going against the current of the culture and you're going against the current of biology. Yeah. It's a lot of force. Yeah. Oh my God. And when you, you earlier you said people tell themselves like, why should I be kind to myself when I'm, when I'm screwing up? What's your answer to that? Why should they? If you're being self-critical because you're, you're engaging in a behavior you don't like, right? You're like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. It goes back to what I said earlier, which is the only way to change that behavior is through kindness to yourself. I mean, that's just the only way. That's, that's, uh, the truth I know for myself is truth that I've heard from other people. When we beat why ourselves up, why is that? Yeah. It, it gets to this part that I like to call magic. Like, there's just something magical about being kind to yourself. I, I don't even know how to explain it in a lot of words, and I can't say like, oh, once you do this practice, like you're going to experience this magic. It, it's just like, there's just this, this knot of self-judgment when you're kind to yourself, it like relaxes and opens. And that allows, that allows you to make change from a place of loving yourself. And to mm -hmm. be honest, I guess I don't know like what the reasons are behind that. Like why does beating ourselves up not make lasting change. 
I think it's because it's coming from a place of fear and fear is meant to just do like short term effects, right? Like survive. And where if you switch gears and now you're coming from a place of love or kindness, there's like so much more space there. And it just creates this drive to want to to mm-hmm. become a better person or, or make better changes. You talk about magic. Um, there's It's actually been explained by science. I was reading about it the other day and I can't remember the exact wording, but it's exactly related to what you're just sharing. When you're kind to yourself, it calms your nervous system. You're mm-hmm. no longer in survival instinct. And when you're in survival instinct, it's like you said, short term. You're just trying to survive um, versus when your s- nervous system is calm, then you can regenerate. Right? Yes. Yeah. And you create more pauses. When, when does change happen? It's when you create a pause between uh, a, a stimulus and your response. If you're, right. if you're in survival, you react really quickly. And you're always recreating the same patterns versus if you slow down, there's the stimulus. And then if, you're, if you've slowed down, then you can choose a more intentional response. And that's how you grow, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't start becoming a better parent just because you, you show yourself self-compassion. It's part of all of what you're saying. There's awareness brought to it. There's a space between the stimulus and your response. And out of that space grows the potential for you to make a different decision. Mm-hmm. And kindness is kind of like, self kindness is kind of like the lubrication for that whole process, I guess. So it just, it just holds the space for that to happen in like such a transformative way that I just, I, I don't know how else to describe it except to say, you just have to start practicing. You have to experience it. I mean, there's just, there's only, so, words will only carry you so far, you know, like you have to just mm-hmm. practice and it is a practice. It's not like a, oh, I'll be kind to myself today and tomorrow I'm going to be a perfect parent. You know, obviously it's a practice. It takes time. Yeah. So the three steps, just to summarize, are awareness, notice that that's going on, that you're being mean to yourself, that you're being harsh. Uh, Step two, common humanity. So normalize that that's happening, that you're not alone. And three, bring care to yourself. Now, uh, step three is like, okay, that sounds good. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. What does that sound like? Can we have a concrete example? of yeah. words you use like I, I get so many clients telling me like I, I don't know how to talk to myself kindly because I've never done that and I've never had adults doing that for me when I was a child so it's like learning a new language for sure yeah and this is where it can feel really weird and foreign and uncomfortable when you first start doing it because you're like oh I've never had to say those words to myself but um, one thing I like to do, and, and again, for everyone, it's going to be different. And it's really about like tapping in and asking yourself, like, what do I need? Because everyone is so different. But I'll just share some things that I do. So the first thing I like to do is just put my hand on my heart when I've noticed, ah, oh, there's suffering here. And you, you frame it in the common humanity, you normalize it. And then I just like to put my hand on my heart. And depending on how deeply judgmental I feel about myself, I may just do the hand on the heart or I may put it with a phrase. Like one phrase I really like to say is I care about this suffering, you know? And again, the phrasing, you really need to fine tune it for you. Whatever unlocks the door, right? Whatever really helps you feel like, ah, like in the minute I say I care about the suffering, I just feel like, oh, I, I part of my nervous system, right? It relaxes and it says, oh, you know, I'm safe. And another phrase that people use is, may I be safe? May I be kind to myself? May I accept myself as I am in this moment? May I accept my life as it is in this moment? Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a, those are a few phrases, but you can just play around with it and just pick whatever feels right for you. People are always worried about, like, I have to say the right thing, but Honestly, you know what the right thing is. You, you, your heart will tell you what it needs to hear. That's so, so important. Yeah, we don't need like yeah. a to be told how. We just need to develop this relationship with ourselves. Mm, Ask yes. ourselves what what do you need to hear right now? Yeah, and that can be hard at first. So you know, play around with the phrases that I just suggested, or just play around. 
you know, if I don't feel up for saying phrases, I'll just put my hand on my heart and then just imagine like some tenderness or, you know, loving energy Mm -hmm. going from my hand to my heart. You know, you don't have to bring words into it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other, the other thing that I do is like, I'll just let myself cry. Letting ourselves just feel our emotions can be such a big step of self, of self kindness because so many of us are taught it's not okay to have like, you know, anger or sadness or grief. And so just letting yourself cry, which is also like a very therapeutic biological process, uh, can be uh, usually comforting as well. Mm-hmm. How do you allow that? How do you open the door when you've been used to telling yourself you don't have time for this? Mm. As a mindfulness meditation teacher, I believe all things in life come from mindfulness, right? Like every step of every day of every interaction should be rooted in mindfulness, awareness. So it's just really about practicing that awareness. Like, oh, you know, I feel like crying right now. Oh, my response is, I don't have time for that or that's stupid or, you know, just begin to be aware of these thoughts that are driving your behaviors because your behavior is driven by your thoughts. So if your thought is, oh, it's I, it's not important to cry or it's stupid, that's going to drive you to not cry. So just if you bring awareness and then just give yourself some space to, you know, if you can sit somewhere privately or wherever you feel comfortable and just see where it goes. Obviously, not about forcing anything, just opening, just slow openings, you know, mm-hmm. might not be overnight transformation. Some people have told me I'm, I'm scared that if I let myself open it's just going to be an abyss because i've repressed so many tears over time and Mm. like i'm gonna have to cry for two weeks straight yeah that can be tricky there's a lot of fear about feeling our emotions and i always like to say to do it in baby steps right so if you are ever in the depths of an emotional experience like you're crying and you're starting to worry you know, you're trying to get anxiety about the crying because you're you're not knowing when it's going to stop. And again, it, we can get into areas of like trauma here. So if you're talking about like you have an experience with trauma, like this, uh, don't listen to me. You need to go speak to somebody who's like a trauma therapist, right? Like you have to be very careful. And so everyone has different backgrounds. But if we're not talking about trauma and you're talking about a general fear, you know, just sit and see if you can be, if you're crying and you're starting to feel anxious about it, just sit and see if you can be with anxiety. You know, that's really what mindfulness is all about, is just seeing if you can be with what is there. And if it's getting to this point where you're like, I'm uncomfortable, this is scaring me, then, you know, there's different practices that we do in mindfulness meditation where you can open your eyes, you focus on your surroundings. Like um, there's an, an anxiety technique where you focus on a point and then you like blur your vision and just like, whatever you can do to help your nervous system relax because ultimately it's all about the nervous system right like when we're getting all worked up and we're worrying and we have anxiety the way to come back down is to regulate your nervous system so Mm -hmm. get get outside go for a walk maybe listen to a podcast so that you change your focus yes whatever you need to do to feel grounded and safe and again that's so different for everyone um But yeah, and so it can be helpful before you even start this, it can be helpful to come up with some ideas of like, okay, if I'm starting to feel overwhelmed in this process, like, what can I do? What will help me feel safe and grounded? Maybe it's, you know, I pet my dog, or maybe it's like I go outside, or... I love that. So if you see, I love to say that when you see an obstacle to something, so in this case, the obstacle would be, well, I'm scared that if I start crying, I'm never going to stop. Then for every obstacle, you can find a strategy. So if this is the obstacle, then you can prepare ahead of time. What can I do if that happens? It it makes me think of the, the, there's a show on Apple TV called, I think, Shrinking. And it's it's a comedy show. And they need to grieve because um, this man's wife has passed away and his daughter's, basically his daughter's mom has passed away. And what they do, they set a 15 minute timer for grieving so they set a 15 minute timer they put some sad music on and then they cry for 15 minutes and then when the timer rings they go do something else that that's funny right <laughs> but for some people that might be what makes helps them feel safe like what gives yeah. like a sure 
to feeling their feelings if if they've never practiced that before. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's so many ideas about doing things right. And I love that you bring this up because, you know, setting a timer might not be the right thing for somebody, but it could be totally the right thing for somebody else. So just try to let go of any of your expectations and ideas of like, what's the right way to do this? Do it in a way that is feels safe for you and helpful. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's around feeling your feelings. But if we go back to being kind to ourselves and like, how do we talk to ourselves this way? I think it's super normal for there to be judgment, for us to judge ourselves. Kind of like you're when you're learning a new language. No, I speak French and I've had people tell me like, I don't want to speak French to you. I'm not good enough. And you're going to think it's funny. Mm-hmm. In order to learn a language, you've got to be willing to sound silly. In order to learn anything, really, you have to be willing to sound silly. And I was reading in a, I'm I'm reading the book called, a book called Effortless right now by Greg McEwen. And he talks about like a language teacher who says you have a bag full of beads. And let's say there's a hundred beads in there. Every time you make a language mistake, you remove a bead. By the time the bag is empty, you will master the language. It's the same thing here. Um, like just tr- try to try to be kind to yourselves and to yourself, and let it sound silly, let it sound cringe, and over time, it's going to become a new normal. For sure, yeah. The first step is just doing it right, even if you if even if you don't feel anything different, even if it feels totally goofy and you don't see a change. Like the first steps is just to practice it. And I, I, I can't promise results, but what I have seen is that over time, things will open up for you. Nobody knows how long that will be, but if you keep doing this and you keep showing up for yourself and you say, ah, suffering, and then you bring some measure of care over and over again, you're going to find your groove. You're going to find phrases that work really well for you. You're going to find the different things that really make you feel safe and loved again. And it might take a while, it might take a month, it might take six months before it feels like genuine when you're actually doing it. It could just feel like, oh, you know, may I be kind to myself? Well, I didn't really do anything. And yeah, exactly. That's okay. It's not going to be perfect. There's no judging here. But when there is judging, again, as the mindfulness person, I'm going to say, oh, that's another great opportunity to just be aware. Like, oh, I'm going through this. I was judging myself. So now I'm doing self-compassion. Now I'm judging the self-compassion. Like, it's just another layer to be aware of. And yeah, just noticing the moment when you the cake. Yeah, it normalized. It's okay. Everyone does that. Everyone goes through this process, right? Mm-hmm. You're not unique in that way. It's totally normal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not linear. You don't get like a little mm. bit better every day. It's, you, you, it, it's messy. Tell, tell us why, what's the impact? Why should we do this? What's the impact that we can expect to see? Let's like let's I would love to hear examples from your own life. How has mindfulness and self-compassion improved your own life? Do you have concrete examples? Mm, I do. Yeah. I mean, just in general, practicing self-compassion is going to decrease all kinds of feelings of fear and isolation, comparison, and then at the same time, it increases feelings of optimism and acceptance. And then just general aliveness. I mean, that's where that magic comes in. Like there's an aliveness that comes out of this. But one of the ways that it's really helped me is with interpersonal relationships. Um, Because really self-critical people tend to think that other people are being self-critical of them. And so when we get, when we have a close relationship, like with a partner or a friend, that can really sabotage that. And so for myself, I was really seeing this play out in my marriage. Like I was constantly assuming that my husband was judging and criticizing me, even in like completely neutral statements. I would find some way to like twist and be like, oh, well, you're totally being an ass and criticizing me, right? And so what self-compassion does is, again, starts with the mindfulness, right? Notice, oh, there goes that story again of like, He's saying something, I'm twisting it, and now I feel awful, right? So just noticing that. And then normalizing, right? Lots of people do this in relationships. It's super common. And what it does is it creates this huge emotional distance 
right? Like it's really hard to have a thriving relationship with when one person is constantly thinking the other person is being critical. Mm, creates conflict when there is none. Yes, exactly. And how do you build a healthy relationship off that foundation? You know, you can't, you really can't. And so it's just this process of noticing, normalizing, and then showing myself the care in, in the various ways that I, I had said earlier is putting my hand on my heart and be like, ah, I see what's happening again, you know? And <clears throat> it's totally transformed our relationship. It's not perfect, right? This is not a goal of like, oh, I'm going to be perfect and I'll never have suffering and blah, blah, blah. There are days where I, I, I still notice the mental games, like he'll say something and I'm like, oh, he's judging. But now instead of reacting, right, it's like we talked about before, there's that space there. And I take the space and I say, oh, is that really true? No, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not true. And then I can go through the process, right? And so instead of it turning into a fight, nothing happens, right? I, I just, I take care of myself the way I need to be taken care of. He doesn't even know anything is going on and we can move on with our day. And the, the emotional distance is like from, goes from, you know, this wide, to this wide. You get closer. Yeah. That's beautiful. And it saves so much energy. Yeah. Because if oh all God. of your energy is spent on imaginary judgments, on assumptions, then you have no energy left to for your dreams, for right. your passions, for for what you're interested in pursuing. Yeah. And it, it just sucks the fun out of it too. You're like you have this relationship where there's so much potential to like enjoy each other. And without self-compassion, that potential is just like down mm. the drain, right? Mm. The amount, the number of amazing relationships that could exist if this work was taken more seriously. Yeah, for sure. How much better people w would feel within their skin and with each other. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's magic. I, keep, I I mean, there's just so much magic to this process. I, it, it. I always talk about the analogy of being mean to yourself is like you have a mean boss inside your inner workplace. Mm, yeah. And if you have a mean boss at work, you don't want to show up. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to show up to your life every day if there's this mean voice inside your mind. It makes everything harder. Yeah. That's why this is transformative in developing your relationship with yourself as well, because you don't want to work for that mean boss, right? You don't really like that mean boss. And so when the mean boss is you, it's like, there's always this friction of like, I don't like myself. That's like a whole nother level to this and where self-compassion can unearth the roots of those things and, and bring the care to it that it needs so that it can just open and fall away. That's what happens so much with this process. It's not about striving. I want to I want to be a better person. I want to, you know, do the right thing every time. And it, there's like a lot of striving in that. And with this practice is what happens is all the the ways that we behave harmfully, they kind of just they just kind of fall away. Like I, it's the magic again. It, there's just something about this process that just kind of dissolves the roots of fear and judgment in a way that you don't have to try to do anything. You just show up and be kind and like the way forward just kind of opens. Mm -hmm. I love that. I'm curious to hear, so you've told us about your, a lot about your mindfulness practice and your process. We, You and I have worked together in coaching as well. What have you learned in coaching that's helpful for you that's different from what you've learned in your mindfulness practice? The coaching aspect really helped me focus on my confidence building more than mindfulness. I would say that the mindfulness really helps you be aware of the of the self-sabotage and the self-judgment. Uh, but the coaching really took that a step further and and said, uh, maybe go deeper with how can I believe in myself more, I guess. Mm. That was like the biggest, the biggest shift was, you know, transforming how can I believe in myself more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the mindfulness helps 
you n- neutralize, get to like a stable ground. Yeah. And then from there, from what I'm hearing, the coaching helps you, you know, jump from the stable ground. Yeah. Mindfulness is like rooting into the present. But then where do you go from there? Right. And so coaching was like one path forward of like, I'm here, I'm aware of what's going on. And how do I make some changes so that I can grow in the belief of myself? Which mm-hmm. ultimately grows confidence. Yeah. I love that. And you you've given us an example of how mindfulness has impacted your relationship with your husband. Do you have a, a, an example of how coaching has had an impact in your day to day? Well, I would say that the, the most obvious glaring place that it's had an impact is with my work because I wasn't really even aware, but I was having a lot of a lot of blockage in not only believing in my worth at work, but also being able to communicate that to my bosses. And so coaching really helped me kind of uncover where those things were hiding where those blocks were hiding, and then how to move through them. Mm-hmm. We worked a lot on knowing the value you bring to the table, right? Yeah. The unique value you bring to the table and then not expecting others to just see it, but you being able to believe in it so much that you can express it clearly. Yeah. It was a lot of work with doubts, you know? There's so much. I had a lot of doubt around that and... The coaching really helped me question those doubts and see them for what they were. Mm -hmm. Which they were what? I mean, a bunch of garbage, you know, like just a bunch of metal, mental uh, refuse that needed to be taken to the dump. Mm -hmm. I love that analogy. Uh, (laughs) Are there any, before we, before we leave, any go-to methods or tools that you want to share that you haven't shared yet um, that you have developed on your own or that you have learned in mindfulness or via coaching? I don't know if there's anything that I haven't shared yet. I mean, my biggest tool is always awareness, mindfulness. You know, without that, there's nothing else. There is literally nothing else. You can't move forward without that, I don't think. I don't believe. And then the second biggest tool is normalizing. You know, what What I realized I was doing so much before my mindfulness training was really taking everything personal. And there's just this big shift that happens when you realize it's not personal. Feelings are not personal. The self-judgment talk is not personal. It's universal. And so there's just such an opportunity there to create some space in your life just with that that understanding alone. Um, And then just remembering that suffering does not mean that there's something wrong with us. It's part of life. It's part of being alive. It's not something that doesn't mean we're broken, right? It's just part of life. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, I just want to say one more thing. Start where it's easy, right? So like we were talking about before, like I'm afraid to cry because what if, I haven't cried in 10 years. And what if I can't stop, right? So you wanted to start where it's easiest for you. For me, parenting was not the place to start because that was a really charged situation. For me, where I like to start was with work because there's not as much pressure there for me to be kind to myself. So start where it's easiest. The stakes are lower. Yeah, exactly. And Does that, you were talking about the awareness, the normalizing, does that all happen in the background or do you have activities in your routine that you've implemented Mm. or is that just something that you do when you need to do it? Right. So as a meditation teacher, what I find really helpful is to meditate. I try to meditate every day. And for me, meditation is just a place to practice awareness, right? Right. Because your mind's going to wander. I, I try to meditate for like 30 minutes. So that's a lot of time to give your mind to like wander around. And so it's like going to soccer practice or any kind of practice. For me, meditation is that practice where I sit and I'm just going to practice my awareness muscles. Because again, just like self-compassion, 
awareness is a practice uh, in its own. And so we have to strengthen those muscles of noticing when we're lost in thought and bringing ourselves back. So meditation is a huge tool for me. And then also I like to do what's called like movement meditation where walks in nature, you know, but I don't go walking in nature to like hike three miles. There are times I do that, but when I'm doing it for awareness practice, I go slowly and there's different kinds of things you can do while you're walking to make it like a, 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 a walking meditation, a movement meditation. So instead of sitting, you're walking, you know, so there's a variety of different ways, but meditation is probably my biggest tool for practicing awareness. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. And the last question, I want to know if there's someone that you look up to that you find really inspiring in this, uh, in the world of mindfulness and self-compassion that you think my listeners should discover. Yeah. So Kristen Neff is like, a huge figure in self-compassion world and she's got multiple books out she actually has like a membership program that you can join where once a month they gather and you know there's q a and there she talks and so if you're looking to dive more into specifically self-compassion i would look up kristina she's an amazing resource and then just for mindfulness in general jack cornfield is one of my favorite mindfulness teachers he talks a lot about compassion you know there's a lot of overlap with mindfulness and compassion um, but he is probably more, I would say, on the mindfulness side. So yeah, Jack and Kristen are two really great resources. Awesome. Okay. And uh, so Laura, please tell people where they can find you. And I think you have an invitation to make. Yes. Yeah, so I have an Instagram. It's called Laura Garcia Official. <laughs> and you can find me there. What's happening, what's coming up is in June, I'm going to be teaching an introduction to mindfulness meditation course. It's four weeks. We meet once a week for four weeks. And it's really just like to get a taste of what mindfulness is about, what mindfulness meditation is about, um, how it could help you. Um, it's a really short program, but it's a great place to start if you've never done anything with meditation or maybe you have a little bit, but it hasn't worked out. So yeah, that's coming up in June. So if you want to look me up on Instagram and send me a DM, I can uh, send you more details about it. Okay. So you want people to DM you if they're interested and you'll tell them more about how it works. You got it. Yep. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for coming on the podcast. This was fascinating. And I have felt my nervous system calm down as we were talking. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> thank you, Marie. It was a pleasure to be here. If you love what you're hearing on the Self Growth Nerds podcast and you want individual help finding a new direction for your life and developing the courage to make your dreams a reality, you have to check out how we can work together on selfgrowthnerds.com or message me on Instagram at selfgrowthnerds. My clients say they would have needed that support years ago. So if you're tired of feeling like you're wasting your life, don't wait. Get in touch now. And I cannot wait to meet you.